Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 9, The Scarlet Deluge That fall, Paul Revere did organize a spy system. Thirty artisans, mostly masters from all over Boston, were the center. Each of these men had workmen and apprentices under him. And these had friends, and their friends had friends. So this web of eyes and ears multiplied and multiplied again until a British soldier could hardly say he'd like to swim in Yankee blood or a couple of befuddled young officers draw out a campaign on a tablecloth at the Afric Queen, but it was reported. It was noted exactly which regiments were on duty in different parts of Boston and how strong were the earthworks Gage was putting up to protect his men if the country should rush in. All such news, important and trivial, was carried to the 30, meeting secretly at the Green Dragon. It had caused comment that so many leading Whigs had been seen ever and anon converging upon the observer's office. It aroused no comment that 30 men of humbler ranks, master workmen like Paul Revere the silversmith, Thomas Crafts the painter, or Chase the distiller, met at the Green Dragon. This old stone inn was owned by the Masons. Most of these men were Masons. So why should they not meet in the proverbial secrecy of their society? Every time they met, each man swore upon the Bible that these meetings be kept secret. That anything they discovered of British plans should be told only to the four men who were looked upon as leaders of the Boston Whigs. These were Sam Adams, John Hancock, Dr. Warren, and Dr. Church. Already many others had thought it safer to leave Boston. Anything Johnny picked up, he usually reported to Paul Revere, but sometimes to Dr. Warren. He had been assigned his own particular duty. This was to keep sharp track of Colonel Smith and the other officers of the 10th Regiment who were living at the Afric Queen. As long as Goblin was stabled there, No one was suspicious if Johnny hung about the stables, the yard, and the kitchen. He was on good terms with the British grooms, and by great good luck from the point of view of a spy system, intimate with the colonel's horse boy, Dove. Don't you lose track of that Dove, Johnny, Paul Revere commanded him. For if ever the British march out to attack us, a colonel's horse boy might well know something is happening in advance. Every day, Johnny knew what orders were given to the 10th, and he knew other boys and men and women and girls were as carefully watching the actions of the other 10 regiments in Boston. Lydia, the handsome black laundress at the Queen, extended her own eyes and ears into the very bedrooms of the officers, and often, as he helped her hang up sheets, she would tell him this and that, but nothing of any value until one day, She called him out of the stable where he was grooming Goblin. Johnny boy, she called, you help me hang up these here sheets and I'll give you a sweet. What's up, he whispered as soon as he had helped carry out the heavy basket of laundry. Last night, just before bedtime, Colonel Smith, he sent for me because he says I sent up a shirt as wasn't his. And that dare Lieutenant Stranger He was standing by the fireplace thanking his colonel for permission to go on de little business. He was looking real happy, like young folks do as have been allowed to attend a party. But a little business might be anything. Yes, but stranger, he likes fighting real good. He ain't no cardboard soldier like some of these British boys. And he whistled happy as a robin as he went to his own room and he sat up for an hour more writing letters and tearing them up and writing again. And this morning, he sent one off to Miss Lavinia Light by Dove. But these scraps of paper I got in my pocket are his trials and errors. I can't read, and he did tear them up, but here they are. Lydia, give me your pocket. She unpinned the little calico bag from her waistband. Johnny stuffed it inside his jacket and ran back to the printing office. It took no time to put together two letters which Stranger had written and discarded. First, he had written Miss Lavinia. Johnny knew he was dancing attendance on her. 
a rude note bluntly declining her invitation to a frolic, which on the 15th of December would follow a military concert. Today was the 12th. Evidently, said Rab, he explained too little in his first letter and too much in his next, so he tore them both up and tried a third. Rab, Mr. Lauren, and Johnny all had their heads over the drawing board where the second letter was pieced together and spread out. The first part was missing, and he had never finished it. As Lovelace said so long ago, I could not love thee, dear, so much loved I not honor more. Tis honor only, my dear, my very dear Miss Light, which forces me to decline your most gracious invitation for the 15th of December. The honor of a soldier and eyes even brighter than your brilliant orbs, the bright eyes of danger call me forth. To you alone I will confide that on that night I shall be 60 miles north of here, for we must have all of our forts sufficiently strengthened so as... Then he stopped. Sixty miles, said Mr. Lorne. That's Portsmouth, Fort William and Mary. They have only a handful of men on duty there and a vast store of powder and ball. No wonder, Rab was saying. Stranger tore that letter up. It certainly let the cat out of the bag. Where are you off to, Johnny? I'm off to Paul Revere, Johnny yelled over his shoulder. He had not stopped for overcoat or mittens. From the lowering December sky, handfuls of snowflakes were falling, but as soon as they came to earth, they turned to ice. It was a bleak, black, dangerous day for the long ride north. Ten minutes after Johnny told him the news, Revere was in the saddle, buttoning his fur lined shirt out to his ears. His wife had so recently borne him another child, she was still abed. She rapped on a window pane, and Johnny ran to her. He forgot this, she said and handed him the hasty scrawl she had had the wit to write. In it, Paul Revere was begged by a make-believe relative in Ipswich to come in all haste. His grandmother was on her deathbed. Johnny had to laugh. The British soldiers at the neck were asking more and more questions of any known Whig, and sometimes, for a whim, would refuse to let him pass and often again delay the trip. Mrs. Revere's letter would allay their suspicions. That night, over icy roads and through howling winds, Paul Revere rode the 60 miles. Even before the British got into their transports, word had come back to Boston that the King's Fort at Portsmouth had been seized and His Majesty's military stores stolen by the rebellious Americans. Chilla reported to Johnny that Lieutenant Stranger did indeed attend Miss Lavinia's handsome frolic and a more gloomy young man she had never seen. And we're going to stop here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Till then, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've reached down and clicked like and subscribe. And please leave a comment. Stigger says ta-ta for now. Love you guys.